does work, okay. Yeah. It works. Good afternoon, everyone. Buenas tardes. My name is Olivia Calderon, and we're going to get started. I'm uh, with the New America Foundation, and it's such a pleasure today uh, to welcome you to our Fall Health Wealth Speaker Series. We were in Los Angeles on Tuesday, and yesterday we were in Oakland, and today we're in Fresno. And uh, along with our partners, the United Way of Fresno County and, uh, and the uh, Economic Department here at Fresno State University, we're so pleased to be having this conversation here in Fresno. Because a lot of the health and wealth disparities that we'll be discussing in detail today, we know are amplified here in the Central Valley. And, and the need is great, and the challenges are great. Uh, and so uh, we've been working to advance a health wealth agenda, and, uh, and we want to, uh, to continue to have these various conversations throughout the state. Because we know that not one organization can do this alone. Uh, we need to work together among established partnerships and uh, raise uh, awareness about the various uh, initiatives that are taking place, the programs that are now in place, uh, and ensure that, uh, that we also um, build broad support for a lot of these ideas. Um, so I'm going to begin just briefly sharing a few words about the New America Foundation. We are a national nonprofit, nonpartisan policy institute. We're based in Washington, D.C., and we're also in Sacramento. And in Sacramento, our asset building program and our health program stepped up to the challenge um, that, uh, that I had the pleasure actually of hearing Dr. Tony Icon from the California Endowment um, and just put out there for us in the asset building space, those of us that are working on financial empowerment initiatives, to say that, um, that poverty drives health outcomes. And we also know, because of the research that our colleague Marco Pavina and Nikazi have been doing, that many Californians, Americans across the country, are just one medical emergency from financial ruin because of inadequate health coverage. And so with that, uh, we wanted to take advantage of the passage of the Affordable Care Act. And I uh, know that within the act, there are various provisions that, uh, that enable families to become more financially secure, um, that, uh, that millions of, of Californians will now have coverage. But, but even with uh, insurance, uh, folks are still going to have to be responsible for out-of-pocket costs, which is why it's so important for us to create opportunities for folks to build their savings throughout their lifetime and have that emergency fund to be able to absorb emergencies. And so the New America Foundation, we, we develop policy initiative proposals through research and, uh, and legislative advocacy to advance these goals. Um, and so with that, I'm going to begin by introducing our moderator today, uh, Chet Hewitt. He's the president and CEO of the Sierra Health Foundation. And, uh, and he joined the foundation in 2007. And before joining the foundation, he was the, uh, the director of the uh, Alameda County uh, Agency, Social Services Agency. And prior to that, he was the associate director of the Rockefeller Foundation in New York and in San Francisco and has been nationally recognized for his work. He sits on an array of boards, and uh, it's such a pleasure to have him here today to moderate our, our discussion. He'll introduce all of our panelists, uh, and, uh, and then everyone will come up and present, and we'll open it up for discussion. So with that, will you please join me in welcoming Chuck Hewitt. Uh, and a lot of work in criminal justice and justice in the early part of my career. 
I really didn't realize that was a downstream intervention. And what got many people to the point that I was defending them in court was because of poverty and other kind of life circumstances that often push them. It's not to, in some ways, uh, somebody eliminate responsibility for behavior, but push them to activities that were often not good for themselves as well as the communities in which they live. And so you started thinking about, you know, what would be a different intervention other than trying to suppress some evidence so someone could walk back out the door, right? There's got to be something else to do that before I walk out the door. My second role will be serve as a moderator, uh, which I will do after I introduce uh, uh, the members uh, on the panel who are here today. Let me just start by saying that the social determinants field is a field of study that looks to understand often dramatic variations uh, in health status among groups of individuals that are closely linked to the group's social and economic status. That comes out of the World Health Organization's kind of description of uh, the social determinants of health. And these variables often include access to care, poverty, education, living conditions, uh, and even leisure. The short and easier to recite version of this uh, for me is understanding the health implications of where and how we live, learn, work, and play. And so I'll see in a few minutes as I try to move through this quickly that there are profound implications to these particular sets of issues. And those folks say to me, why this fact is important? One thing that we know in health to be true, and this is agreed upon by you know, uh, health researchers regardless of their ideological orientation. And that is only about 15% of your health is really determined by your access to health. That 85% of your health, this is the 85-15 is, the, is really largely dependent on social factors, some of which you decide on, whether you eat, what you eat, how much you smoke or whether you smoke, how much alcohol or other things that you might consume which may or not uh, impede on your ability to be healthy. But it's not about, you know, well, it's not all about health care. Uh, to be most effective, health care defined broadly uh, must not only think about treating illness, it must also think about promotion and wellness. That's the cost control for the health is in making people uh, healthier. And this is where the understanding between the link between health and wealth connection becomes essential to the development of policy and practice to really support efforts to achieve this goal, which is the elimination and the reduction of disparities in health uh, and the control of health. When one looks at the gradient of health, uh, the poorer you are, the more likely it is that you will live a shorter, less healthy life. And there are few, if any, developed countries in the world where health disparities are more pronounced than they are in America, despite the fact that we spend more than any other country on health care. $2.5 trillion in 2009, or about $7,500 for every person in this country. You would think that with that kind of expenditure, we'd be doing a lot better than we are in health uh, outcomes. Uh, for males, uh, we are 32nd in the world, and for women, we are 40th. One community that we actually looked at was in um, Mer uh, Montgomery County, Maryland, a rather affluent community, a larger black and white community where folks are doing pretty well, although there are some disparities in uh, those groups in that community as well. And in that, in that particular county, life expectancy for whites is 80 years. For African Americans, 63. 22% difference in lifespan. That's a whole lot of it. Terms of just span. Your immediate Fort County region um, is by no means immune from this reality. I think no community is. We point to this conversation as part of the fact that this is a national challenge. Consider another example in the Bay Area. A large health plan is actually mapped health outcomes in a Bay Area, East Bay. Um, and their disparities actually follow poverty maps. So in some ways, folks are not surprised. They look at East Oakland, West Oakland, Richmond, the poorest health outcome. What's surprising about this particular map is that it is uh, a map of uh, health plan participants, all of whom have the exact same access to health care. And that from Kaiser. So despite having Kaiser coverage, 
and one assuming that there's nothing that someone in these particular communities could get that someone in a more fluid community could get based on that plan. This isn't about all residents, it just mirrors the whole residents' plan. There are still extraordinary health disparities. In your uh, four county community, I'm talking about Madeira, Fresno, Tulare, and Kings, and look at the UCL and Center for Health Policy. Uh, you're one of the least affluent areas in California, with per capita income well below the national average. Valley has some of the lowest per capita personal income, $29,000 uh, per year, $42,000 is the state average. Highest rates of unemployment, 15.6%, about 12% uh, for California. More residents below the federal poverty level, 21%, 15% in California. Higher rates of not only uninsured, 29%, as opposed to the state, 23%. And more residents over 25 without a high school diploma, 29% as opposed to 19% statewide. And if you think about education in particular, which many would argue is the pathway to reducing health disparities, and that was actually discussed in a recently released a national prevention strategy that was uh, put out in June by the Office uh, of the Surgeon General, which says that education is one of the most important interventions we can take to address health disparities. Education actually is a primary determinant of your socioeconomic status. The more educated you are, the more money you will make on average over the course of your life. And many of you are probably familiar with the million dollar difference between someone who graduates from college and someone who only has a high school degree. If you look at mortality and education link for U.S. citizens 25 to 64, these are really mortality rates per 100,000. For those who have or have earned or moved beyond a high school diploma, it's about 206 per 100,000 annually. If you only have a high, high school diploma, it's about 477, twice as high. And if you haven't finished high school, 650 per 100,000. Now, it's simply predicated on your education status. So we know that you will not only live a shorter life, uh, you will have more health problems, um, or likely to have poor health over time. Of the 56 counties rated in the University of Wisconsin's uh, national study on uh, county health status, all counties in the country, except that actually that's not true because two in California didn't make it to the rankings, so 56 are actually listed uh, in the rankings. Uh, Kings County actually ranks 40 of 56, Fresno 43rd, Tulare 46, and Madeira 49. You lose more residents to cardiovascular and respiratory diseases than do other counties. You've had an 8% reduction over the past decade. The rest of California's reduction, 22%. So some good news, but you're still lagging behind. You have more deaths from motor vehicle accidents, homicide, and suicide in California as a whole. Have higher rates of asthma, delirious exception for folks over the age of 25, and hypertension in California as a whole. And our hypertension is called the silent killer because we know it's related to things like renal failure, heart failure, stroke as well. So it's one of those you know, really predatory illnesses that you really got to get a, a hand on if you want to deal with experiments as well. Uh, and Latinos experience a high interest rates of diabetes and more hospitalization for the illness as well as greater mortality. African Americans, higher death rates for cancer, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes in California as a whole as well. With so respect to years of potential life loss, which is really a, a measure of premature mortality, which is death before the age of 65, the four county regions saw a 7% increase in the years of protected, productive life uh, potential loss, while California, the whole, uh, experienced a 5% reduction. And when we look at the WHO, and they say the poor health of the poor um, is, has more to do with the unequal distribution of power, income, goods, and services. This unequal distribution is not a natural phenomenon, but the result of the toxic combination of poor social policy, unfair economic arrangements, and bad policy. This is not a political conversation. This is the data, and this is what it actually said. You can come at it from different ways, but we know in this country, given how much we're spending, we could do a heck of a lot better than we're doing it. We have to get smarter and be more honest about what we need to do. I hope that my remarks are not meant to demonize kind of individuals and institutions. I know many people in this community are working hard to address these issues. 
and as I said, the health wealth challenge is a, a national one requiring national, state, and local interventions. One of which has to be uh, dealing with the health wealth a divide in this country. I offer them as kind of a call to action. And I know this community is very interested in this work. Uh, I know that two days ago, uh, you received notice that Fresno had actually received the Community Transformation Grant, which is really focused on reducing chronic disease and illness prevalence of, of those illnesses in your community as well. I encourage you all to be actively engaged in that particular work as well. But I offer them as kind of a call to action um, and the expectation that uh, the conversations you will hear today from this knowledgeable engaged uh, panel uh, will offer specific ideas for how you can go about supporting and growing your ongoing efforts to improve health uh, in this community so that the uh, community is as healthy economically, socially, uh, civically uh, as it could possibly be. Uh, the distribution of those attributes are fair and equal and not dependent on where you live, where you play, or where and whether you work. So let me stop there and introduce uh, the panel. And I will do this in order of uh, <coughs> I will introduce them, and I will do it in order that they're going to be presented. First up is, uh, is going to be uh, Mark Rocavania, who is the Executive Director of the Access, Access Project, and author of the report that you're going to see today, Unleashing the Power of Health. Uh, that's the Health Growth Divide report that you're going to see today. Uh, Lee Hase, who's a Senior Health Fellow at the New America Foundation. Olivia Calderon, who's Director of the California Asset Building Program at the New America Foundation. And then some local uh, expertise. Uh, Norman Forbes, who's the Executive Director of Fresno Healthy Communities Access Department, uh, and our Michael Alexander, who's the President and CEO of the United Way, who I know has done some wonderful work here uh, with uh, health disparities as well. Uh, so with that, I will call uh, to the uh, podium, uh, Mark. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so just before I begin, uh, just to get a better sense of who's in the room here today, how many of you are doing work in healthcare or the public health arena? And how many of you are doing sort of uh, economic Justice or anti-poverty work. You can raise your hand more than more than once. And how many of you? Any anybody here from a financial institution, lending institution? Great. And others. Um, okay, that's that's helpful. Thank you for uh, for doing that. Uh, I want to thank Olivia and the New America Foundation and the local partners and and uh, um, and all of you for being here today. I appreciate the opportunity to speak on this issue of. Of, of medical debt. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, this health wealth connection coming at it from a slightly different angle. I think, as Chet said, poverty drives ill health, and ill health oftentimes drives people further into poverty. Um, so I'm going to be talking about issues related to medical debt, how medical debt leads to other problems for people who have it, and wrap up with some. Uh, opportunities to address the medical debt side of this that hopefully will help relieve some of that um, uh, pressure that, that, that people face, especially low and moderate income people who have, who have uh, who experience illness or injury. So there's slides in the packet. I'm, I'm going to go, uh, I'm not going to go over these, uh, every, every slide here. Um, I'll talk broadly about uh, health trends, issues related to medical debt, explore a little bit this health wealth connection, look more closely at some socioeconomic demographic data related to, to, to medical debt and then talk about these opportunities. So big picture, I think as Chet said, two and a half trillion dollars spent in 2009 on, on, on health uh, nationally, a little less than two and a half trillion projected that it was a little more than two and a half trillion in 2010. That was a, represented more than 17% of our gross domestic product. But the trend here, I think, is really interesting. I want to call your attention to the projections for 2020, uh, that we will spend more than $4.5 trillion 
on health care costs. And that will be the equivalent of just under 20% of our gross domestic product. Um, in spite of what we spent in 2009 and 2010, there were nearly 50 million people with no health insurance in this country. That number for 2010 represented as, uh, an increase of about um, of just under a, a million people. It would have been greater than that if not for some of the provisions of the Affordable Care Act that have already gone into effect, in particular a provision that enables young adults to, to get coverage under their parents' plan. So that's why coverage about a million people. There's also some provisions for, for people with pre-existing conditions who are invited at time by insurance otherwise. Um, there was just a, uh, an article in the paper yesterday from the Kaiser uh, Family Foundation, um, employer survey of health care costs. They've been tracking this for the past 13 years. Uh, and they said workers' contributions over that 13-year time frame increased 168%, while wages increased at about 50%. And the inflation rate during that time period was 38%. So the result of that is that health care costs are more and more an increasing burden in terms of family budgets. This is information from the, the Commonwealth Fund. 73 million Americans in 2010 uh, experienced some type of bill problem, a problem paying for, for a medical bill, contacted by collection agencies for bills that they received, said that they have to change their way of life in order to pay medical bills, or had bills that they had incurred medical debt, bills they were paying off over time. The figures for medical debt are about one in five uh, people across the country have medical bills or medical debt. Medical bills are paying off over time. In California, and these are older data, data from 2007, so that's prior to the, to the recession, about 13% representing more than two million Californians had, had medical debt. And the distribution of that is uh, varies by county, and I think, as as was previously mentioned, I think it's probably uh, a greater percentage um, in this area here. Um, so, what are the consequences of medical debt? Some are obvious, um, um, some maybe less so. But um, I think the the, the Kaiser uh, information that was mentioned previously is 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 telling. Uh, there are health access problems for people with medical debt, even insured people who have medical bills. Um, there, there's, there's a rich body of literature that shows that people without insurance are, have very different care-seeking patterns than people with insurance. But even people with insurance who have medical debt, they, they have care patterns very similar to the uninsured. So this in and of itself is a risk factor. Medical debt in and of itself is a risk factor. You know, it, it, takes, a, it takes a toll on, on families and individuals who have it. Stress, depression, anxiety, um, and it spills over. So there are access problems that result for people with medical debt, but then once it does spill over, there are also other problems that happen uh, that, 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 that result, um, and, and credit problems result for people, and we'll come back to that um, in a minute. Um, again, you know, access problems, there's national data on this, and, and California data. Um, people with medical debt are much more, like, much more likely to forego care uh, than those without it. Again, you know, poverty leads to ill health. Ill health leads to debt, which reinforces this gap, kind of a growing gap for people who are struggling to, to pay these bills. Um, nationally, 22 million Americans in 2010 were unable to pay for you know, other expenses, basic expenses, food, housing, heat. <coughs> Uh, 29 million people used up savings. That, that, that actually, that bullet is incorrect. They didn't take out a loan. They, they exhausted their savings. About 40% of the people with medical debt exhausted their savings trying to pay it off. These are not debt fees. California numbers are, are similar. About a half a million Californians were unable to pay for their uh, basic expenses because of medical bills. And three quarters of a million used up savings trying to pay off those bills. Um, once you deplete savings, you go to other assets that uh, you may have, or uh, do something uh, possibly risky to try to pay these bills. Uh, people are borrowing against their homes, uh, trying to, to pay medical, med medical bills, or putting things on plastic, you know, in, in incurring additional credit card debt, or taking out payday loans, trying to pay off the bills that they've incurred. 
I want to focus um, less on health and more on wealth and talk about the effect that medical debt has, has on people's, on people's uh, credit. But 30 million Americans in 2010, again, the Commonwealth Bank, were contacted by collection agencies for medical bills. Studies published in the Federal Reserve Bulletin have found that half of the accounts in collection, half of the accounts in collection are medical in nature. Once a bill is sent to collection, it is on a path that, that really is a path of financial ruin for, for the person who has this bill sent to collection. These, are, these go into the credit history section of a credit report, which is weighed most heavily in terms of determining somebody's credit score. These are considered accounts in arrears. Um, and even small dollar balances, and I, I, I have a couple of uh, uh, highlights from stories that appeared in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times on this slide. And we're talking uh, accounts of, you know, bills of $15, several hundred dollars, have a huge effect on one's credit score and their ability to access affordable loans, whether it's for an automobile or the rate of interest charged on a credit card, or in the case of these stories here, people's ability to refinance or get mortgages. So the effect that a $15 bill or a $200 bill, that has been paid off. This is a bill that's been paid off, but it's still lingering on a credit report. It can cost tens of thousands of dollars over the life of a mortgage. Again, creating huge problems for people, disproportionate problems. And you know, other, other work uh, indicates that you know, people are at risk. Uh, studies uh, that work done through the National Foreclosure Mitigation Counseling Program found that about 6% of the people counseled through that program were at risk of losing their home uh, because of default. Uh, about 6% of them said that the primary reason for their mortgage default was medical. And this was greater than an increase in the interest rate charged on their mortgage. Um, Here's some uh, data. There's not a lot of racial ethnic breakdowns of, of medical debt, but this is something that's older, from an older Commonwealth study, 2005. But you can see uh, African American population um, had a much higher percentage of people with medical debt. Um, I don't think I have, I'm just looking ahead here to see if I have a slide. There's another study that was done on the, um, what is on a credit report, um, and actually, the incidence of medical accounts in collection of being, appearing on credit reports among the African American population and Hispanic population is two or three times greater than the general population or, or whites. So, you know, there's, I know there's been some discussion about disparities in credit scores. Maybe part of it is being driven by this issue. Um, again, you know, income, wealth matters. So the, again, applaud the work of the New America Foundation in terms of trying to build wealth. You can see here the percentage of people at or below 133% of the poverty level. About half of them uh, are spending more than 10% of their household income on health care premiums and out-of-pocket costs. Uh, at the highest income levels, uh, more than four times the rate of poverty, still 20% uh, 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 of, of the population is spending more than 10%. These are the medical debt figures, uh, similar similar trend line here. So what are the opportunities to deal with this crushing problem? Well, Leaf's going to talk more about some of the opportunities in the Affordable Care Act. So health insurance uh, uh, and medic programs like Medicaid, Medi-Cal uh, are really anti-poverty programs, very important programs. I want to talk just briefly about some other opportunities on the credit side. Um, there's some provisions in the Affordable Care Act around, around charity care of nonprofit providers. Uh, the billing and collection practices of nonprofit providers, whether or not bills are sent to collection agencies and reported to the credit bureaus, can have an enormous effect on, 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 a, on a family's long-term economic stability. And those are things that can be addressed locally, can be addressed at the state level. Um, in some states, there are proposals to, uh, to limit the rate of interest that can be charged on medical bills, that discourage medical providers, from using, or, or, their, or their collection agencies from reporting to the credit bureaus, and there's an act in Congress right now, uh, the Medical Debt Responsibility Act, that would require the removal, and this is a pretty simple uh, solution to a, a, to a huge problem, require the removal of medical bills that have been fully paid or set from a credit report, so that they don't linger for seven years and drive down one's credit score. That once that balance is zero, that that those accounts must be removed from a credit report within 45 days of that, of that um, account being cleared out. So what we have today is millions of people who have bills that were sent to collection, maybe because of confusion, 
uh, maybe because they were struggling to pay off this bill that was a surprise to them, something that wasn't anticipated. But they did the right thing and they paid it off. Well, again, you know, that can stay in a credit report for years and drive down one's credit score. So um, there are, I think there are numerous solutions to the problem. The Affordable Care Act is going to bring relief to, um, you know, to, to many, you know, for people at, uh, at the lowest uh, income level, Medicaid's going to be expanded. Lee's going to talk more about this. In the middle income level, there are going to be some private, public subsidies for private insurance coverage. And at the higher income levels, and, and for those who have private insurance, the rules of the game are going to change so that coverage is more comprehensive and it's less likely that people with insurance um, uh, will experience medical debt problems because of the inadequacy of the insurance coverage that they have. So uh, with that said, I'll hand the mic over to, to uh, my colleague Lee. I'm, uh, I'm figuring it all out, getting my orientation. <laughs> well, I'm purely speculating here, but I think that when Kevin Costner was in high school in Central Valley, he just might have gotten the inspiration for that memorable line for, in Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. <laughs> and for the Affordable Care Act, the, the federal health reform, as they all know, passed Congress last year. The jury's still out on whether this is true. Um, contrary to the hopes of many, uh, some of them in this room who worked to pass the bill, health reform has remained a political litmus test. Media attention is focused on repeal and on provisions that aren't even in the legislation, such as death panels, rather than the practical consequences of implementation. Of Americans who know that the legislation has passed, over one quarter of them think it's been repealed. And even here in California, based on polling, more than 30% of low-income Californians, those who'd be helped most by the provisions in the Act, think it would actually make their situation worse. So for a few minutes here today, I want to leave the world of ideology and legend and return to the facts. The ACA is neither perfect nor the cure for all the ills of our broken health care system. But taken as a whole, health reform should greatly improve the financial security of low- and middle-income Californians it'll equalize access to affordable quality insurance coverage, make it easier to avoid the medical debt problems that Mark's just laid out, lower the hassle involved in enrolling in public programs, and give individuals and communities the tools to reverse health disparities in their own neighborhoods. And again, getting to the theme of this particular conversation, if it works as intended, I think the ACA can be a bridge between folks who work principally on health care and health policy issues and those who work um, principally on the poverty, financial security, and social welfare issues. Just to look back and refer a couple of slides of why the ACA was, was needed so much. This is an international comparative study done by the Commonwealth Fund on the number of folks, percentage of folks who went without medical care because of cost by income. And you can see here that even middle and high income people in the United States had this problem as much as um, you know, it had this problem more than, than all the folks in other countries in the world. And for low-income individuals, it's pushing 40%. Similarly, um, a decade of real income gains have been wiped out for the average American family by rising health care costs, um, especially devastating to working Americans and the uninsured. What would have happened if we hadn't done anything? Would have, the number of uninsured would have gone up to over 60 million. Um, employer health spending probably would have increased by 100%, and uncompensated care, the charity care that's given in hospitals, probably by a similar amount. So just to put a little bit of perspective on why we had to have this bill. The heart of the ACA, of course, is expanding insurance coverage and improving the quality of that coverage. It's also an issue of financial security. We know from many comparative studies of the uninsured and the insured, the coverage results in better access to care, improved health status, lower out-of-pocket costs, and reduced mortality. And the expansion of coverage is expected to take place, as most of you know, in two major ways. Changes in eligibility for Medicaid, Medi-Cal in California, which is historically the health insurance program for some but not all low-income Americans. And by offering a refundable tax credit for the purchase of private insurance on newly established health care markets or exchanges. And when this process is complete, 
32 million Americans are expected to gain coverage, between 4 and 5 million in California alone, and that will include over 3 million Latinos, 2 million Asian Americans, or actually 1 million Asian Americans, and almost half a million African Americans. And what this slide shows, and I won't go into it in great detail, is that it accomplished this intended expansion and other changes, that, uh, changes were made that would transform the health insurance market and also the ways in which health care is actually delivered. And the most important features are the individual mandate, which requires the purchase of coverage by adults who have the means to do so, and a variety of demonstration programs aimed at strengthening primary care and reducing excess spending on medical treatments. So to look first at, at Medicaid and Medi-Cal, I titled the slide, Medicaid is Health Insurance. And the reason I do that is because Medicaid is a program that has its roots in welfare, in categorical eligibility. You wouldn't qualify if you're an adult, a poor adult man, unless you, know, you had dependent children or this kind of thing. One of the most important things the ACA does is to get rid of Medicare as well Medicaid's welfare roots, at least, um, and to make it a, a true health insurance program for all Americans under 133% of poverty, without acid tests for adult Americans who fit, fit that bill. And Medi-Cal expansion will, will play a huge role in improving the financial bottom line for California's low-income populations. John Gruber, the MIT economist, in fact, has estimated that the household budgets of those between 133 and 200% of poverty in California will be improved by a combined $5.5 billion after health reform is fully enacted. And also um, in California, thanks to a federal waiver that's unique to this state, the state could get as much as $10 billion to enroll up to 500,000 low-income Californians in all our counties. Um, these will be folks who can have their coverage continued or newly enrolled. And public hospitals will have the opportunity to revamp their operations and their facilities so they're more likely to become after the passage of the Act, places that individuals with either public or commercial coverage will seek out. And so far, so good, but here's the problem, which all of you, I think, in this room know. Medi-Cal is the target of $1.7 billion in budget cuts, the most recent state budget. There's little or no low-hanging fruit there. California has the lowest per capita Medicaid costs and among the lowest rates paid to providers in the country. And if the budget cuts uh, that are made in Sacramento are approved at the federal level, um, there'll be 10% cuts in those already low rates, limits on the number of doctor visits, and unprecedented co-payments. So there's reasonable concern here that the brakes are being applied even as we want to actually push in the accelerator and get more folks covered with good benefits. And then if you look at the final line of the slide, even after the Affordable Care Act is implemented, even if everything goes well, there's still going to be over a million Californians who won't have insurance coverage. And those are mostly um, immigrants without legal status. So another thing that the ACA does for this and other states, it's really tried to strengthen the safety net to provide money to uh, federally qualified health uh, centers and community health centers, $11 billion worth in the original plan, about $1 million of that for California. Um, and, the, and the folks who go to these uh, community health centers, as you know, mostly people of color, uninsured, medically indigent, and folks who are paid for by the counties. Um, the, the rub here as well is that a lot of that money is, you know, may be pulled back in the federal, and federal budget cuts and possibly deficit cuts before it actually reaches these health centers. And the second, um, the, the second, the second um, piece of this foundation are really um, health insurance exchanges. And what are they? They're, they're nothing more or less in some ways than an insurance store with standardized health care products, health insurance, and subsidies that go up to 400% of the federal poverty level, which is about 88,000 for a family of four. So in many ways, it's a link between the, the coverage programs for the for low-income populations and those that are for the, you know, the, the, the working middle class. Um, there are examples of these in place in Massachusetts and Utah, for instance, very different kinds of things. And as you probably know, California was the first state in the nation to pass enabling legislation creating the California Health Benefit Exchange after the passage of the ACA. It's actually two, one for individuals, two exchanges, and the other for small business. And the exchange will be the sole place through which individuals and small businesses will be able to get the federal subsidies so that people can pay for affordable coverage. 
And this raises a lot of questions, the exchanges. It, it's again back to that field of dreams point. Will enough people enroll in the exchanges so that insurers will offer reasonably priced products so that you get that sort of reasonably priced coverage and then it becomes a self-perpetuating cycle. Are the products going to be comprehensible? Will they be standardized? Um, what will minim minimum benefits be at each level of coverage? And these are things I'd love to talk about more in the Q&A if that's of interest. So I'm going to finish up by pointing out a couple of bills that are um, on the governor's desk right now in Sacramento that are needed to actually keep the, the wheels rolling and get the, get the Affordable Care Act up and running. And one of these, um, AB 1296, is particularly critical because it sets a framework by, for the ACA by establishing a single standardized application form for Medi-Cal, Healthy Families, the Exchange, and County programs. And for every one of you, and I suspect most of you at one time or another, have been involved in enrolling folks in programs. Uh, simplifying this process will be one of the most critical things toward uh, making the whole uh, system work. And likewise, um, SB uh, 922 improves the Office of the Patient Advocate, it's an existing office, but it'll make it much more um, capable of delivering good information to potential beneficiaries. And finally, I'd like to talk for a second about the social determinants issue that Chet raised so well at the outset. Um, even though it's not the specific focus of the ACA, uh, there are a lot of provisions in there, green shoots provisions that can serve as an entering wedge to start thinking about these critical social determinants. Um, everyone who works in public health and many or most of those who work in health care knows that it's the places and circumstances uh, where people uh, live, work, and play, not access to acute medical care that determines for the most part what, or whether people are healthy. Um, there's also growing evidence from studies that financial security itself is an important contributor to good health. And as we've heard before, uh, one of the elements of the ACA is community transformation grants, and both Norma and Chet run organizations which have received these happily in the last few days to move this good work forward on tobacco control, obesity, and chronic illness. So they are living examples of the sort of transformation that the ACA is going to bring about. And so I'll conclude by saying, that with this uh, focus on, uh, find, on, on helping people uh, keep their resources in place, as well as all the other things in the ACA, we're very hopeful that the ACA can be, in fact, what we're always looking for, that missing link. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, the incredible job of helping folks understand, again, the connection and the need. Again, here in California, two million folks are struggling with medical debt. Uh, and many of these uh, individuals have insurance, uh, but it's inadequate. And, um, and we have this incredible opportunity with the ACA. Uh, but we know that folks are going to need to build their own personal savings. And I want to begin by sharing a personal story of how I was introduced into this space um, and why it just resonated with me instantly. See, I am the child of immigrants. I'm first generation. I was, I was born in Los Angeles. My father's from El Salvador. My mother's from Mexico. And my dad, uh, he came to this country, uh, like many immigrants do, because of that desire to want to tap into his, person, his own potential and build savings and build wealth, build assets. And so he actually was working in a, in a shoe factory, um, and he realized quickly that he was not going to be able to make it um, working in the shoe factory. And he made a friend on the bus one day who had shiny shoes. He asked him, what do you do for a living? And the guy says, I sell pots and pans. My dad says, oh, you must make, you must speak English really well to do so. And he said, well, no, actually, I sell to Latinos because they're the ones that cook for their families at home. And my dad said, well, how do you make this happen? And he said, well, uh, in various parts of Los Angeles, but also on the weekends, I go up the uh, five and I head over to the 99 and I go into migrant communities and I sell in migrant communities. So my dad says, can I join you? The guy says, yes. So he starts doing this on the side, and that's how he met my mother in Arvin, California. He knocked on my mother's door, and my grandmother opened the door, and of course my father is gorgeous, and so she <laughs> bought everything he was selling, and my father saw my mother, and, uh, and they met, and he brought her with him to Los Angeles, selling these pots and pans that he proudly says are manufactured in West Bend, Wisconsin since 1911. His ability to be able to do so, to, build, to be able to, to have ownership and, uh, and go and start selling this product and, and have built small savings, allowed them to then purchase their first home. 
qualified for a loan, a loan that did not blow up in their face, and then raised us in this house, a stable place for me and my sisters to then be proud of where we live, be a part of a community. And it was this way that you know we, we would join my father, um, knocking door to door, and uh, he was proud and, and had ownership over, 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 his, over his trade. Uh, we then uh, were always told, if you work really, really hard and you do your part, then you can achieve your dream. You can do anything you want to do. Uh, at the time, there was a lot of gang violence in Los Angeles, and they actually, um, in my mother's wisdom, she's like, you know, let's go back to the valley. And, uh, and they took us to Visalia, California, where Ted had Costner graduated from Mount Whitney High School. And, uh, and they took us to Visalia, California, and that's where I graduated from Bolton West High School. Um, and my dad, my dad likes to believe that, you know, he kind of picked himself up by his bootstraps. And he did this all alone, and, and you know, because they worked really hard. Um, but I quickly understood that that was not true. That there have been investment policies in place and opportunities created for folks to be able to tap into the potential. And those are those asset building policies. Those opportunities for an individual throughout the, li throughout the lifespan to be able to build these assets. And when I was introduced into this field, I thought, aha, uh -huh, absolutely, that's right. And when we see the great need across the state and across this country, we know that these investments have been quickly disappearing and been detrimental, particularly in communities of color. When the census numbers uh, recently broke and showed that six million Californians were struggling with poverty, that's really just the tip of the iceberg. What we should really be thinking about is asset poverty. Here in California, we know that 30% of households are asset poor, meaning they don't have enough savings to be able to survive at the poverty level for three months if they were to have a medical emergency or lose their job. And so at the New America Foundation in our asset building program, we advance assets in all policies, in education, in banking, in taxation, and in health. And, uh, and, and, our ch and challenge our colleagues to kind of break out of their silos so that we could advance in our mutual goals and, and endeavors and create these opportunities. And so for the past half decade now, in Sacramento, we've been advancing, developing policies and then advancing them through the legislature and have created uh, programs that now exist at the state level. So the first, for example, was the Bank On program at the state level. And this, of course, was inspired by what was happening in San Francisco. And at the time, Mayor Newsom and Treasurer Cisneros, uh, we brought research to them to show that, um, that over half of the Latinos and Blacks in the city were unbanked. 50,000 residents were unbanked, meaning they didn't have a basic checking or savings account. And with that one, it's going to be nearly impossible for you to begin to build your savings. And so they uh, partnered with financial institutions, with banks and with credit unions, to understand that this is an untapped market. And if you develop products and services that are tailored to the needs of this market, that it's a win-win situation. And so we developed starter accounts for folks there in San Francisco. And it worked so well that we quickly took this idea to Governor Schwarzenegger, and he created the state-wide uh, program so that cities could start sharing um, best practices. And so now you have six cities throughout uh, the state, including Fresno, that have bank-on programs. Uh, but uh, bank-on programs work really, really well when you have a bank and a credit union to partner with. But what happens in communities where you have no financial institutions to partner with? We believe we need to continue to build on Bank On through a banking development district program where states and credit unions would be eligible for state and local deposits if they agree to open up in a community where there is clear need and develop the products and services that are tailored to the needs of the community. And so we've been advancing this idea for some time now. And this year, uh, in our health wealth agenda that you all have there before you, um, AB 38 is now on the governor's desk. And, um, and we're hopeful uh, that he supports uh, this legislation that would require uh, the Department of Financial Institutions in partnership with the Office of Consumer Affairs to go out there and map the state of California and identify where those communities are so that the legislators can have a very clear roadmap of where the need is and we can have strategic investments into these communities and bring these financial institutions uh, to these communities. Because in the state of New York, it's worked really well since 2002. And we know that it can work here in California as well. In addition to that, we know that tax time is the ideal time to get folks to start saving. And so we passed legislation uh, in 2006 uh, to require the Franchise Tax Board to use the tax form 
is that you know easy place, automatic place where folks could save. And so we amended the state income tax form to allow folks to split their refunds into a checking or a savings account right on the tax form. But of course, understood that this was just the beginning, an incremental approach to start introducing accessibility into the franchise tax board and get them to kind of be more innovative and not just out there collecting our taxes, but also financially empowering uh, California taxpayers. And so in addition to that, what we were working on is how do we get families to save for college from the very beginning? Because Chet said that you know, education is key. It's one of those key uh, determinants that will um, enable us to, to be out there, be competitive, and, and, and earn more money, and, uh, and have that money to be able to save. And so we uh, have legislation moving forward that would have amended the state income tax form to allow a taxpayer to roll a refund into a college savings account. Our scholarship program that is housed in the treasurer's office uh, and uh, make it automatic for someone to be able to do so. Now what we found is, in, in moving this legislation forward, that the Franchise Tax Board could do this administratively. And so we're working with the Franchise Tax Board to do this administratively and make this change on our tax form to allow families to do so. Uh, in addition to that, we've introduced accessibility into the Department of Social Services. We know that low-income families need to have the ability to save and shouldn't be disincentivized or penalized for doing so. And so looking at our social programs and looking at those rules and trying to change them is something that we've been heavily involved in. And so the asset test when it comes, for example, to our Welfare to Work program, the CalWORKs program, that was created to help people become you know, self-sufficient and enter the workforce and get temporary assistance to do so, there is this silly asset rule. You can't have more than $2,000 in savings to be eligible for the program or to stay on the program. And you can't have a car worth more than 4650 bucks. And we believe the car is the two in welfare to work, especially in California and especially in rural communities where you need to have a car to get to and from work. And so uh, we, uh, in 2006, again, had legislation that was signed by Governor Schwarzenegger that created savings exclusions so that someone's, uh, their 401k or their kids' college savings account wouldn't have to be depleted to get temporary assistance. Or their individual development accounts, these restricted savings accounts for low-income families wouldn't be depleted for temporary assistance. And in addition to that, made financial education um, allow families to be able to go to like a community college or, or to go to a nonprofit that's certified to offer financial counseling and education to make that a, a, a workable activity and allow families to get credit for that. And so we've been building on trying to eliminate these rules, and there's legislation now on the governor's desk, AB 1182, that would eliminate the vehicle asset test from our state's uh, CalWORKs program. And it's received overwhelming bipartisan support because a lot of Republican members, particularly in rural districts, um, what they've been witnessing is something that's been happening across the country, which is to say that uh, we have folks that are going and seeking help for the first time ever. Unemployment is at 12%. In rural communities, it's much higher than that. It's double that. And so uh, they, they know that, uh, that you have these families um, that might, might have a car. The car might not even be worth the, you know, over the 5,000, 10,000 bucks. But what happens is that, you know, because they might be upside down on those car loans. But regardless, uh, that it's a silly rule that needs to be eliminated because when we looked at data, it only keeps out one tenth of one percent of actual people that actually apply for the program. And it costs millions in administrative dollars because our county workers are then having to go through Kelly Blue Book trying to figure out how much your car's worth. So the governor is now, um, he's, uh, he's, we were hoping that he signs this bill uh, and uh, it makes it again, um, it helps this program actually work for, for working people. Uh, Leaf mentioned the health bills. But, uh, but uh, again, we've been having this conversation throughout the state because we want to raise awareness and build support. Uh, the governor has until October the 9th to sign many of these bills, uh, and, uh, and the time is now to weigh in. And, uh, and uh, if your organization wants to support, happy to have a conversation with you about who to contact and how to make that happen. But again, when I said earlier that we can't do it alone, I want to stress that again. And I'm thrilled to be a part of the California EITC and Asset Building Coalition. I'm the chair of this coalition that was created by five organizations, Citibank, uh, AARP, uh, Catholic Charities is also on board, the San Francisco Office of Financial Empowerment in San Francisco, and, uh, and many others. But the coalition is growing and it's ready to partner. If you want to be a part of the coalition, we invite you to do so. The second symposium is going to happen on November 15th in Los Angeles. 
and, uh, and the registration is open. So with that, I know my time is up, and uh, I'm going to pass this on to, to Norma Forbes.
in the valley. Let me see, I had a little slide here that uh, I think I just messed up since I didn't show the slides. There are lots, you've seen a lot of the data, so I'm not going to actually run through all that data. But we have higher rates of persons without adequate health insurance or ongoing relationship with a medical home, less use of prenatal care, birth, where the worst birth outcomes, and a high prevalence of asthma and diabetes. And everyone who lives here in the valley really knows that. That results, obviously, in this uh, reduced life expectancy and the quality of life. You add, however, to those, those statistical data, the valley challenges. Our public health funding deficit, our public health system is crumbling. Um, we have a stressed healthcare delivery system. We have a change impact going in, in our, both our hospital and our clinics of technology impact. The ARA funds have created, provided a wonderful opportunity to uh, access health technology funds, but change of technology is disruptive. They're wonderful once you get through the change, but all of these organizations are, it's unusual. They're all, it's hitting everybody at the same time, the clinics, the hospital, everyone. On top of that, you put a state budget crisis. You put a local county crisis, the county uh, board of supervisors, their lack of funding, and you add the federal political party stalemates. What do we have? We have confusion and we have inertia. People do not know what to do, how to work their way through this confusion. There's a leadership deficit because people are kind of in a hold pattern. However, there are opportunities and there are possibilities to step up on a local level at a regional basis, I think, and really take control of this. I think we need to really work at the grassroots level and show that it doesn't make any difference to me, to all of my partners who's a Democrat or who's a Republican. We learned years ago how to work together. I think we can show on the local level we can solve some of these problems. You know, so I think Fresno and the Central Valley can turn this around and become a leader in this. That's you know, really my message on this. Um, we had wild enthusiasm over the passage of health reform. We're all excited about that, you know, enthused about being able to do it, but we're still learning about it. This program is great because it, when we've got this crisis going on in healthcare right now, where people are um, getting discharged from the hospital, we don't know why. You know, they're just, I find, I, my office across the street from them, people are found walking around. They've been discharged, they have no place to go. You know, they, it's incredible. Um, we're learning about health reform, we're talking about it, we're learning about the health benefit exchange, we're trying to understand it. It's not easy. When you're in the midst of crisis, it's not easy to learn this. We're working with teaching our families what it means, but the reality right now, so far, there's very little impact on health reform for low income populations. They don't have health insurance. So extending Medicaid has not really helped yet. We have so many people without health insurance. The unemployment numbers are growing. We're seeing more and more middle income people without health insurance. So it's still adding to the confusion and the mix that is making Affordable Care Act and health reform still look like it's far down the road. We were really hoping the low income health program would really uh, give us that bridge to get there, but that opportunity, $56 million um, with Roman. The Board of Supervisors, too much risk. Fresno County has little money to draw in the match. The low amount of money that they have, and it's true in all, the, all of the counties in the valley, makes it riskier for them to commit that match. Um, agriculture workers, you know, agriculture workers, unfortunately, were left out of health reform. That's what we have in the valley. It's our biggest industry. You know, when we're talking to our ag workers, you know, the farm workers, what can we tell them? Well, maybe someday um, immigration will address this. Well, that's been being discussed for a long time. The Valley is very, very conservative. Um, you know, that trying to move, we're trying to move to a culture of coverage. Uh, we're working with our families to help them understand the opportunities here. We have found, uh, in a program we ran for the undocumented, that it takes almost two years for a family that has never had health insurance to be able to understand how to use it. Those of us who have employer in health insurance, we know how to work through the system. Our families don't know that. They have never had that opportunity. They think Medi-Cal is a hodgepodge of services, reduced benefits, unstable. Healthy Families here in California has announced, you know, they, they, when every 
three every year they announce they may be out of funds, and they're gonna have to disenroll. People don't know what those are. Is that what health insurance is all about? You get coverage sometime and then you don't get it? You try to take your Medi-Cal party and it, it, it doesn't work this time? They don't understand health insurance. There's a huge need for education. We work with these, two, these community based organizations to try to be able to help people and help them navigate the system. We're very excited about the health benefits change in that we think that's an opportunity for our certified application assisters that are working in the fields and in the, at the grassroots level, literally in the field sometimes, to be able to um, get some funding to support these organizations. These organizations are in a crisis also. Nonprofit community based organizations don't have enough funding to help the families that they have been serving for years. So, you know, this is all, when health reform came in, the big foundation funding stopped supporting these local organizations because health reform was gonna get everyone into health insurance, right? So why do we need to continue to fund local community-based organizations that are after helping them? The need is greater than ever for that. So, you know, what we're looking for is, um, we want to move forward with the Affordable Care Act. We totally agree and support it, and we're 100% behind it. Um, we just aren't sure how we're going to get there in the next two years. We want to see, we're working to expand workforce capacity, definitely strengthening the safety net, uh, working to support primary and specialty care, those areas where we're using some technology like telemedicine to try to be able to get access to doctors that we don't have here in the Valley and access to um, learning more so we can reduce the demand on specialists. Um, we're looking about um, teaching health centers. Very excited about that opportunity to be able to get our residents trained in the rural clinics as opposed to in urban areas where they don't understand really what primary care means in an agricultural area like the valley. And then we're looking at um, community-based um, clinics and she has the weakest little sign. What does it say? Does it say time? It's purple. I can't read most of it. Sorry. <laughs> Everyone's been ignoring it, so I have too. <laughs> I get my time. <laughs> um, the teaching, the uh, community based health centers is a wonderful opportunity where, um, school based health centers, I'm sorry, that's what I'm trying to say, where we have some of those not enough, not nearly enough. So this, there, the, um, there were three, I think, three um, funded programs here in the Valley that are going to be great, where you can actually have a doctor at a, a school clinic. Many of our families think that their kids get covered, they get care at a clinic, and they think that's a medical home. And they don't have, you know, they, they only have nurses there. So this new model, a lot of this leadership and opportunities are coming from federal opportunities that we are really trying to take advantage of. The community transformation grants, absolutely wonderful opportunities. But again, you gotta put that in perspective of we're in a crisis. So it's hard to even get up the resources to fund, to try to apply for those competitive funds. And we believe the way to do that is collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Work, we accomplish everything within HCAP with working with other, other partners where we can magnify our resources by working together and strengthen each other by sharing our resources and our commitment to the same goals. Um, I think the Valley is strong in that and um, I think that we do have, because we haven't been able to go independently down paths by ourselves, I think we believe more in, our, in collaboration and sharing and working together. A regional approach is our next step. Um, we have been funded, HCAP has been funded with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services a grant bringing in technology to a five county region in the Valley. And we're really excited about that opportunity. Uh, we do have one, yeah, is an integrated one-stop shop approach for um, taking applications, getting people into health insurance. We brought that into Fresno County. We've had a terrible time getting it expanded but now we have federal funds to be able to take it from Stanislaus through Kern. So really excited about that. Lots and lots of opportunities. Um, hoping that we can uh, dedicate, that we can keep our partnerships alive and funded long enough to get through the next couple of years to the, um, the first steps of the expanded 
you know, Medicaid services that are going to be available for the families we're serving. So that's where we're at. Again, the United Way is really uh, proud as we work with our community partners, partners to really change the way our community looks. And we have the building blocks of life of education, finance, and health. If you don't have a good education, you can't have a good financial well-being. You also can't get good, good health. We have a committee that we work with uh, through our partners to really look at how do we advance the common good. And again, the United Way doesn't exist without our great community partners that we have. <coughs> We believe that education, financial, stability, and health initiatives, will, as we partner with elected officials or partners, media clinics, and others, will really start to change what's going on. If you've heard about what's going on in our community, we have a United Way public policy call once a month to really work with our legislators, to work with our community partners, to really make a difference. Some of the laws that you've heard about that we're trying to get implemented or passed or the governor to sign. We are very much a part of it throughout California with the United Ways to make sure those initiatives get to the desk, get passed, and get the governor to sign them. We've heard about all the critical areas that we have, and again, it's the community coming together, and that's what's exciting about it. And I think in Fresno County, we're all working together. Uh, also, we're now working with our community partners from Stockton to Stanislaus and the United Way, really working with. Uh, as our partners in the United Way, but our partners within the Valley to try and really can be concise and bring those initiatives together. Because the Valley has different issues, as we know, than Northern California or Southern California. And sometimes we get forgotten because people think about Oakland and the Bay Area, they think of LA and San Diego. But we have a rich uh, history here that we want to make sure we continue with by everybody working together. We're also working with the California Endowment on their 10-year Healthy Families Initiative, but we're excited about how we're going to move that through. Uh, we have a one year through that process, and we have nine more years to really work on how do we make sure our families are doing well in our community. In either way, with our partners, we use a lot of tools, and one of our tools is 2 and one If you haven't heard about it, uh, the county information call center closed down because of budget cuts, and our call centers, our call volume over the last few months has gone up 60% because people have tremendous needs. Within the call center, it's open seven days a week, uh, 24 hours a day, and we have 170 languages that we can use through interpreters to help people in need. And so if you have clients or families that really need some support, the 2-on-1 call center is a unique uh, opportunity. Sadly, the federal and state haven't seen the need to continue to uh, budget like it's been in the past, give funding for it. But it's a huge need that saves the sheriff's departments and police departments in our county from getting unnecessary calls to 911. But more importantly, these call centers really work with those clients to get them right to the agency they need to be seen at and work to make sure that their problems are being identified. And the police and sheriff's departments just can't do that. It was also mentioned earlier about our Spark Point Center. Uh, we have that as our financial center that we work with our community partners to really provide uh, support to the families that are in need, from housing to financial uh, debt to whatever they need to get out of. And it's, again, it's a collaboration of our uh, community partners. It was also mentioned a little bit about bank on, up in Oakland and San Francisco. We started our bank on uh, Fresno, as it was mentioned, and we've done over 60,000 accounts that we've set up. The only one that's beat us is LA. The last we looked at was about 800 accounts because we have such a need in this community where people are going to the check cashing places and they're, spent, they're taking money right off their income to pay for those check cashing where the, our financial institutions have come together to support them with low or no income or no interest to set up a check and savings account which then gets the families back on their feet. They start to save some money and then they can have a better life uh, moving ahead. We've heard a lot about health. This whole issue with kids and, and, and individuals not getting health care is a huge initiative that we work with all of our partners. And again, it's to make sure people have access to health. 
And so we continue to work with 30 members in a coalition in our community, in our county, and you've heard some of the significant issues that are facing us with uh, families that don't have uh, health care coverage, the debt that they get, and you heard from Norma just like people walking out because the hospitals and physicians aren't getting paid like they need to, and so they have to look at how do we continue to treat all these patients when we're not getting any funding to cover the minimum costs that they have. So it's a critical issue that we need to move ahead on. Uh, some other things, we worked uh, uh, successfully to educate the state legislators on our managed care organization assessment that helps the funds keep coming into our community. And if that process didn't get quite funded like we wanted, but if we didn't get that through with our partners in the, in the county and in the state, 36,000 people would have lost their health care coverage. And so that would just put more people in a pearl of what they're going to do when they get sick and how are they going to be able to take care of their needs. Financial stability, as I mentioned, is a critical one. We believe that uh, that is a second sort of the building block. If you have a good education, you can have finance. Uh, so we really work hard with people. Uh, with, uh, we have our VITA program that works with our community partners who are trained by the IRS. We did almost uh, 6,000 tax returns this year by volunteers that brought back over $10 million back in the community, the county, where people were able to get their tax returns done at no cost and then they were able to get those EITC credits back that helped their families and become more stable. We have people coming into the different areas that we did the tax returns, and some people have three years of tax returns they haven't filed. But again, with our great volunteers working with the IRS, we were able to get them situated so that they could move ahead and get their life back on track. Again, uh, education is critical. We want our kids to be literate, we have a problem in our county, 30% of our kids that go from third to fourth grade are literate to really continue to move ahead, and that's why we have a high dropout rate that we you heard of earlier. So we're working with the county superintendent, the uh, county or the local superintendents of the school districts to how do we get our kids working with their families to make sure that they have the skills necessary so they can graduate, and we heard earlier, if you graduate, then you can have a better income, and hopefully we can get them into training their technical training or college training so that they can have a better life. So these are some of the, just quickly, um, some of the examples that we had. But a good example is we had 333,000 uh, preventable uh, hospitalizations occurred between 2000 and 2005. And those, they could have been prevented, but they weren't. And those are usually about $7,000 per hospitalization. And that's about a $2.3 million bill they uh, put out onto the, the rest of the public. So if we can get people with the right care, the right uh, connections with that health care with physicians and, and institutions, we can wipe out some of that debts there. More importantly, they can get the right health care that they need and they can be healthy in that process. We also need to continue to work to make sure that families uh, get into the exchanges that you've heard about so that they can fact, get the health care that they need. We need to make sure we streamline the eligibility process so there's not all these delays in people getting their health care coverage. And we also make, need to make sure there's good public education. As you heard earlier, if people aren't educated about the process and, and if we're going to lose maybe funding for the, the, uh, the residency program here at the University Medical Center, what are we going to do as far as making sure we have the right people here to provide the health care people need? So in conclusion, I just want to say it's great to be a part of this organization in the sense that we're providing a community resource, but we do it because of our partners. The United Way of uh, Fresno County doesn't provide any services, it's our partners do. But the funding we get through all the campaigns, both federal and state, uh, we are able to then give the money back to our community partners so that they can do the jobs that they need to. So with that, it was a quick one, but I'll stop so we can have some discussion. Take that as our round of applause for all of our panelists and we won't waste any time. Let me quickly summarize. Um, Mark talked to us a, a, a lot about you know, our policy and practice, particularly issues around debt that exacerbate the wealth gap or also wealth gap also exacerbate you know health outcomes for folks as well. That debt is a critical component of that something that we do have the ability to thoughtful policy and practice to actually address. 
I'll leave uh, there was a good overview of the ACA and this that while not perfect, right? It was pretty far down the road to uh, allow us to help us not only leave the health disparity, but creating greater access to uh, health care. Uh, and raise some concerns around state support and cuts and COVID and some of the things that we seem to be trying to walk in two directions and you know that's really not possible. You can't cut and then grow at the very you know same time. I think I'm going to mention that in terms of some of the work that you've uh, some of these things happen in, in uh, uh, Fresno as well. And I, I love your talk, uh, I think, uh, eloquently about the need to not only think about the deficit side of this, but around the asset and wealth and how you know, the ability to have savings is really one of the safety nets that you own personally. It allows you to deal with the traumas that life will go to all of us, but you have uh, uh, some uh, resources in the bank. Uh, it makes it a, a lot easier to deal with uh, when those challenges do uh, uh, before uh, a family or individual. Uh, Norma uh, admitted that her story was not happy. Uh, talked about the system of <laughs> under crisis. Um, and uh, the big need is to really try to figure out how we get from here to 2014 uh, and do that without creating a deeper hole of anyone that we're in now. Paraphrasing. As well, but I, I said that she, you know, she admitted that it's a, not a happy story. But I think you can also see that her passion for this work was undeterred by the fact that things aren't going as well as uh, she thinks they could. It could be better. It could be improved, definitely. Mm -hmm. and, and then, of course, uh, our Michael uh, really talked about the uh, other side of the coin in terms of what's uh, happening in uh, Fresno with some of the unique coalitions focusing on education, uh, health. Uh, financial stability and uh, literacy that way to kind of grow the economy around uh, from the human development side, the human capital side. So the second of development at the end of the day is about human capital development as well. And also some opportunities to kind of grow beyond uh, where we are now as well. You can't simply retreat to the future. You have to think about how you grow into the future uh, as well. That's what the fourth of the So I'm, I'm going to stop there and we were going to have questions right now, but I think that given the size of the story, if you can just kind of stand up, direct your questions whenever you would like to, uh, and uh, I'll give you as thoughtful a response as possible. Yes. Hi, I'd like to thank you all. Uh, I, uh, I'm aware of all when I work for the mental health department for the county in uh, uh, Tulare County. And uh, I really don't want to sound political, but uh, I'm, I'm really concerned about how would you recommend that some of us who are citizens could, um, you know, keep some momentum going, in fact, really get it rolling faster uh, at the federal level. Because I'm really afraid that what I'm hearing is the uh, Tea Party agenda is to make sure that President Obama doesn't have a second term, and that scares me. Um, because I believe that President Obama is the one who has uh, really reignited a passion in a lot of hearts about working at the grassroots level and what that means. And so I'm wondering if we need to be working at the federal level to make sure that he gets reelected so that we have more opportunities maybe to grow things um, and, and put together more bipartisan kinds of uh, collaboratives. Uh, I'll walk in that. Uh, that's how I feel. <laughs> well, without giving anything away about where my experience is, I am and how you should contribute and so But I think there is um, one thing I would recommend uh, is involvement with uh, you know HHS, for instance, regionally. I mean, Herb Schultz up there in San Francisco used to work for Governor Schwarzenegger. He's out, you know, pushing the features of the Affordable Care Act, going into communities. And doing things that you know, healthcare focus in a really quite remarkable way. So I think there are people like her, and we can talk later about a number of others. So we can also talk about the political questions. But uh, I think there there are a lot of people out there who are deeply committed to making this work on the political side and the foundation world. And there's maybe a little more activity there than than uh, we might worry about. So that's my optimistic. And I would recommend that you um, also get involved. Look at organizations like Health Access, um, covering kids and families. There are advocacy groups that are out there that, can, that will deal with mental health issues. 
and you can join them. And they're pretty, they're pretty uh, strong, very impressive organizations. Been around for a long time, and they, they're dealing with federal, state, and local issues. Health Access was just here in Fresno, helping us to fight the um, lose, losing the LHP, which had mental fund, mental health funds in that. You know, so uh, they're a good group, knowledgeable, operating across California state. I just also respond to that. When it comes to asset building policy, uh, there's a tremendous bipartisan work that's happening in this space. Um, from a Republican perspective, they support this work because for them it's about personal responsibility and, uh, and folks being thrifty and saving. And from a Democratic perspective, folks are very supportive of this because you're creating those opportunities for, uh, for individuals, particularly low-income people, to be able to, to build their savings over their lifetime. And at the national level, there are organizations that are doing this work. Um, the New America Foundation, CFED, um, Aspen Institute, are, are in DC um, and building bipartisan partnerships. Um, but, uh, but we do have extremes, um, and, and it does tend to be the moderates, and particularly in the Central Valley that have been leaders in supporting much of this work. Um, I would also like to say that for a lot of these visionary ideas, I'll tell you, um, when I was up there talking about these legislative pieces, I just want to be clear. Um, that we do not believe that any one of these ideas or bills are going to help people permanently exit poverty and grow the middle class and, and deal with our asset poverty rate. Um, but that we need to uh, think ahead, like Chad said, and be visionary and start from the very, very beginning. And at the national level, there's this idea, this Aspire Act, that every single child should be a saver and an investor from the moment that they're born. And that this account should be an asset building account that kids could use when they graduate from high school to, to purchase their first home, to roll into a retirement account, to start their first business. Uh, and, uh, and we've been trying to advance this idea. And it was Rick Santorum, actually, who introduced the Aspire Act when he used to be in Congress. Um, and, uh, and when he moved on, it was Hillary Clinton who took over and, and, and started supporting this idea in Congress. Here in California, in San Francisco, which is really exciting, it's now the first city in the entire country that's testing this idea on the ground. Every single kindergartner that starts kindergarten in San Francisco is starting kindergarten with a college savings account. It's opened by the city, it's seeded by the city, it's progressive in that low-income kids get their savings matched, and the teachers union agreed to have it integrated into K-12 financial education. So now every single kid in San Francisco, what are they being told? The expectations are high. This is just the beginning. We're going to seed this for you. We're going to invest in you. You're going to go to college. And, uh, and they're learning about money management in a very concrete way. But these ideas are bipartisan ideas. I also said earlier that you are, and you have been deputized as MSR. I think that one of the things that people need to know about is, you know, the facts around these sets of issues uh, as well. Because it, and that may not see, uh, seem like a direct engagement at the federal level, but uh, you know, all politics really are local. Uh, and that aggregates up to federal policy and politics when people are engaged at a local level as well. I'm uh, questioning about uh, my name is Larry Hodges, and I am a uh, Bank of America, Maryland, and I'm the uh, president of the uh, Youth and Education Development Component of the Community uh, Volunteers of Bank of America. I, I applaud to Larry, thanks for, for inviting me, and I agree that education is key, and I agree that the way to be framed the data should be pure and not biased one way or the other. My question is this, most of the states do not have a mandate for financial literacy to be taught in the schools. What are you folks doing as advocates of asset building to facilitate that process? We have introduced legislation as sponsors throughout the years to, uh, to mandate financial education be taught in our schools. And, uh, and I found that cost has been a, ma a major barrier. Legislation has been vetoed time and time again because of cost. Because uh, for schools will say, not another mandate, and how are you going to pay for this? And when are we going to find the time um, during the school day to teach this? What we said is, look at states like Texas, for example. Um, in Texas, in high school, they have now integrated it into the math curriculum. And so uh, they're teaching um, high school students about you know, what is an APR and how do you just you know, set up a budget and, uh, and making um, math 
uh, time, you know, that ideal time to be able to connect them with financial know-how. Um, but we have been involved in those efforts and continue to be involved in those efforts uh, to, uh, to create financial education and integrated into K-12 financial education in our state. Um, one of the things that, uh, that we're dealing with is that uh, we're trying to partner with the schools, totally, uh, education, in terms of, you know, whatever happened to, uh, you know, it's not mandated that they have health nurses anymore either. Um, and the schools don't get paid if they have missing children and not in attendance. So I mentioned that we have, um, you know, an electronic application tool and we're encouraging enrollments in, um, in the schools, you know, in terms of getting children and families into health coverage. I want to stress on this application tool uh, because it's not well known. It's called One EF, One Electronic Application, and it uh, is all of the rules for eligibility of any sort of program you can possibly imagine. All social service programs, um, we take applications for any, we, at one stop shop, one application, we take applications, and I have a list here to make sure that I um, have them correctly. We do not only the insurance coverage of Medi-Cal and Healthy Families for adults and children, but food stamps, CHDP for disability, we have uh, presumptive eligibility to get people immediate coverage, WIC programs, Medi-Cal for children, pregnant women, healthy families, Kaiser Child Health Plan. We are the only program in the state that has interfaces already into um, commercial health plans. So when we talk about the health benefit exchange, one app already has much of the ACA requirements built into it, which is available here in Fresno County. We also have earned income tax referral, we have um, the uh, low-income energy assistance, auto insurance, utility assistance, tax credit programs for the families to strengthen them financially with one-stop shop. So when they go to these community-based organizations, they can take an application and refer people not only into health care but financial assistance at the same time. And we are encouraging that people use this and be aware of this program in California, in Fresno, that's available for low-income uh, families. I got it. Um, one of the things we're doing, briefly hit on with our partners, is the whole Spark Point Center. Uh, and you're one of our partners, of course. And it's to make sure that people uh, have financial education so they can be financial stable. And one of the things we received through the Mayor's Council, and actually came from Bank America, uh, uh, from their uh, grant process, is we were able to set up uh, 50, 150 counts with 100, uh, 150 students were able to go through this financial education. If they completed the course, then they got $25 to set up a uh, check in your savings account. And so again, it's our partners that are providing this education, but then your bank uh, and the institution provided the funding through the Mayor's Council to be able to provide that uh, stipend for those students who then got through that uh, process. I know you. <laughs> <laughs> really, really, totally briefly. Um, it's great to hear all the work that's happening at the local level. But again, um, at the state level, there's another bill that you have there before you, AB 597, uh, where the controller has been a leader in the field of financial education, particularly consumer financial education. And, uh, and he's creating a fund, if Governor Brown supports this, in the treasurer's office that it would allow the controller to partner with, uh, with banks, with credit unions, with other uh, nonprofits to create this financial education fund. The idea would be that in the controller's office, they would create a clearinghouse, a website, where consumers could then go and um, search really quickly by putting in their zip code to say, you know, I live at the 95814 area code and I want to know how do I even start thinking about saving for my retirement? What should I be doing? That you would be able to go there and find all the programs that are near me um, that, uh, that are providing these kind of uh, services. Um, so that's one step. But, uh, but also, I have to again stress that this idea that's being tested in San Francisco, this K to C 
a program where every single child is now learning about financial education. Um, we hope that, again, that, uh, that this will be the model that's replicated statewide so that all kids, not just San Franciscans, are learning about money management when they start school. I was kind of curious in regards to the enrollment application, the one-stop shop and the spark plugs seem to be interesting. Um, my experiences with people who have actually tried to enroll in Medi-Cal is that it's, a, you know, besides the long list that you have to do initially, that um, it's having to do it on a regular basis. And it's not just every three months. On top of that, it's every time you get a new social worker and it's the baby's turnover like there's no tomorrow. So every single time, every three months, you have to submit the same information you did at the application point, And then when you get a new social worker, you have to do it again. Um, if by chance you have to be sick during any of those points, and you can't get that paperwork in, then you lose it. And there should be some kind of a guarantee that if you're using it, you don't have to reapply. You're absolutely right. I mean, those are the obstacles um, that exist, even, you know, that have, that's that streamlining that process because um, that churning that goes on with Medi-Cal is unbelievable. Um, but in the electronic application um, tool that we have, that pilot project we're doing with Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services is that we are electronically interfaced into the state Medi-Cal systems so that uh, they will give back to us. It's a two-way interface. They will give back to us the ap applications that are enrolled. And then we will know um, the computer builds in the flag as to when the renewals are due. You know, so that we have, then we can we can notice the family and we can um, have the applications of the sister who would help them contact them and say this is the renewal time. But at the same time, though all of those um, those are barriers to access that we are working in terms of our advocacy groups to eliminate those barriers. You know why do why do we have to have those? Why don't why don't we have an eligibility? You know, if you're using it exactly what you said, why why do you have to go back in and prove that you need it again? We don't have to do that with insurance, right? Regular insurance no one has to do that. I call it regular insurance. And uh, even though I know, you know, you said that Medi-Cal is insurance, um, it's not handled like regular insurance. So it has to be restructured to make it the same, equitable for everybody. Can I just add to that? Because I think it's really important. This, with one EM, uh, there's going to the, the health arena is going to be changing dramatically in the next couple of years. So. Someone who might not be eligible today may be eligible in the future. So, uh, with a tool like what, with one e app, um, it, you know, there's the opportunity for people to to get those benefits in spite of the fact that they may not today. So, I think that's really an important tool. And um, and the and then with you know, again acknowledging that there are problems with it. Um, but the other thing I wanted to say is that um, you know this health wealth connection is really uh, clear and. Um, I just want to invite those working around the economic justice issues in the room into the healthcare discussion and to raise exactly the point and, and that you're raising in terms of the, the barriers to, to these programs and continuing the coverage under these programs. But to bring the, um, the, the, those of you working around and poverty work and economic justice into the health discussion because this health coverage is going to be so vitally important uh, for people and the opportunities are enormous. The challenges are as well, but the fact that there are funds coming from the federal government into the state, in spite of the fact that the state has has budget crisis, and most state, many states do, but the federal funds and the flow of those federal funds, and talking to your local congress, you know, congress people and 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 those in Washington, is going to be very important for those who are healthcare advocates and those of us uh, who are working on on wealth creation and and doing anti-poverty work in general. This will be about well, we have one left. We'll, we have two questions here. Uh, yes. I'm, 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 I'm going to ask. Uh, I'm going to ask the. the Why do we have all the masks? We won't. We won't. We won't get in there. I'll ask for short every responses as well. Go for it. My name is Ray Young with the Valley uh, Latino Environmental Advancement Project. And I think the nail was hit on the head earlier with the issue of agriculture industry. You know, I mean, some of the 
known facts is that we have the poorest counties in the state, uh, while they are at the same time the states with the, or the counties with the highest ag revenue in the nation. There's a big disconnect. And if we pay attention, it's a quarter of the state's revenue of uh, 1.3 trillion, it's about 25 billion. Ag industry, who works in that industry? You'll notice it's Latinos, over 80%, I think closer to 97%. And when you look at the workers within this industry, it's minimum wage, they get overtime after 10 hours, they don't get a pension plan, they don't get health insurance, no benefits, you miss work one day, you're gone, right? And so there's a huge economic justice issue taking place, economic injustice issue taking place there, which is also creating a huge gap in, in health. And one of the reasons why also the Measure of America Human Development Report has identified the region as being the Appalachian of the West. At least, actually, Fresno B identified us as that. And we're going to have a conversation on the 18th of October with the Measure of America Human Development uh, authors here in Fresno talking about what are we going to do in respect to the initiatives that we have uh, 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 been able to bring to the valley, including Smart Valley Places, including SC2, uh, Building Healthy Communities, uh, Fresno's one of the places. How do we leverage those assets? And how do we make something that is going to be sustainable? Because it needs to be sustainable. But at the legislative level of California, I, I, we really need to resolve that overtime issue with farm workers and that health care issue. You know, because industry is banking, they're getting subsidies, but they're not putting anything back. What happens, uh, there's, old, there's elders in my community at 70 something years old still working in the fields. They cannot retire. They retire, they get $500 a month social, social security, maybe. Huge problem. Decades, decades of work. And it's, 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 it's terrible because they cannot retire at 55 years old, go back to their communities, be volunteers in the, in the community action committee or whatever it may be to ensure that education equity is being respected or that the, the small businesses are being able to advance their, their economic wealth to also uh, provide another option in terms of economic development for that farm worker community. They can't do that. They got to die in the fields. So it's a serious issue. And at the federal level, it's existed since FDR, the, even the New Deal. It excluded farm workers. And again, during the 60s. So what are we going to do about it? That's what i got to ask everybody here. I'll take a statement more than a question. With someone no, what are we going to do about it? Answer. That's the question. Quickly. I'm so thrilled, Mr. Lowe, that you showed up today, because I think that your remarks um, help to reinforce why we're all here. That is to say that we, um, you know, I consider myself a financial empowerment expert, and then we have health experts, and then you have a housing expert and a banking expert, but that we need to break out of our silos because uh, individual's needs are not siloed, a family's needs are not siloed, and that if we partner together and start making these connections, we'll be more powerful, we'll have a greater impact, and we'll be able to meet the challenges that you, uh, that you expressed today. Hello, my name is Alicia Gonzalez, and I'm with the Central Valley Health Policy Institute, the part of the state. And thank you, Ray, for asking that question, because I also have that question. But my next question, or similar, is how will the ACA, or efforts of the ACA, that you know of, raise awareness about the expanded safety net um, services at the federally qualified health centers um, in order to reduce their fear? Because immigrants, undocumented especially, are fearful of even seeking or asking. So how are we going to minimize their fear in order for them to come and finally get services which are supposedly going to be offered to them? Yeah. The, um, I'm less familiar with the um, community health centers here in Fresno, but the uh, very familiar with a company at Altamed in LA and La Clinica in Oakland. And the, um, the, the, the leaders of those institutions are you know, excited by the money they expect to come in, although the federal budget cuts in the interim are, you know, hamstringing their opportunity to plan, among other things. But they are, um, all of these institutions that I know that I have outreach programs internally, which they're going to add more money to, to deal with precisely that issue. And of course, the, the existing folks who tend to come to the clinics are, you know, are the best ambassadors. And I know Jane Garcia at the clinic has said that exactly to me, that, you know, look, we have people who are, Telling you know, telling what a good job we do and what a community feel this has, and how you get a you know, really a, a all social services are talked about here, not only you know healthcare work, and so they're um, 
they are actively thinking about that issue of fear, and and, and they have internal, um, uh, you know, they, they they work internally to make sure that you know a person's immigration status, for instance, is not disclosed, or you know, that is certainly something on their mind. As far as the ACA, I mean, I think that the ACA gives the money, and then these very good local institutions, I think, are are going to take that baton and run with it. There's, there's one other opportunity, I think, for um, populations that don't have coverage under the ACA, and that's through the provision in the ACA. That is the question. Right, right. But I think that there is one provision in the ACA that could extend um, some protection to these populations that don't have coverage under the ACA. And that's the provision around uh, charity care, 